minutes than on the sermon. Uh, I, I really need to get it over uh, and complete by the end of Wednesday so that it can get out to March and uh, Seth so that they can get the, the fill in the blanks in the bulletin at least. And so Wednesday morning, uh, I was feeding breakfast to my children. And Tuesday evening, I had just rearranged all the furniture in our living room and the dining room. I was tired of the chairs that uh, the kids were sitting in. They were sitting in these tall chairs, and they were always falling off them and uh, hopping off of them. And I wanted us to be a family around this table. And so everyone is going to sit in the regular chairs, the adult-style chairs. And so Ethan was really worked up about that. He missed his big, tall chair. <laughs> And he had sat in there pretty well. He took it pretty tough uh, that night for dinner. But at breakfast, for some reason, he came up and he was all in pieces. And he was anguishing over the fact that his chair wasn't there. He's not here, so I can talk about it. <laughs> and I couldn't just let him grieve the loss of his chair. I had to lose my head. This is confession time. This isn't about Ethan, it's about me. Even though I'm 40 and he's 8. I had to let that get under my skin that he couldn't let it go, that chair. And I said, no, you know, you're big enough to sit in a big boy chair. You don't need that baby chair. You're sitting in this chair. And he's crying. And I'm upset now because he's crying. And then mom gets, comes down and she's into it. And she's like, what are you doing? You've got to let it go. And I thought about my sermon, and I was thinking, lost in argument, found in Christ. What did I do? I let that bit overwhelm me. I let my point overwhelm me, and I couldn't just let him have his little tantrum. And he was going to get over it eventually. He just needed to grieve that chair. I couldn't just let him do it. I had to get on his case about it. I had to like be in an argument about it, and I was lost. And then Julie came down and helped me realize how wrong I was, <laughs> how I need to let it go and be found in Christ. And we never had these arguments in the church, right? When once we come into becoming brothers and sisters in the church, they always get along. We don't quibble over furniture moves here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, don't, don't move anything in that parlor. <laughs> And today, as Paul is reading to us, or as we're reading uh, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we find, well, we're not alone. Sisters and brothers in the life of the church, uh, they get caught up in their own arguments. They get ensnared just like that quarter is wrapped up in that thread, and they just can't let it go. And they begin to fight amongst each other. Let's have that first fill in the blank. And Paul's writing, and he's, you know, as I mentioned, he's writing to this church, and, you know, he's very careful about the way he uses words. And, uh, you know, and we'll have a little bit more about that in just a second. But as he's writing to the church, he's really getting at now, uh, early on in the letter, just after the greeting, early on in the letter, he's really getting at the reason that I'm writing. And the reason that I'm writing is that there are quarrels among you. There are quarrels among you. And he goes into this letter and he just names it. He says, there's quarrels, quarrels among you. And, the, and Chloe told me, you know, there's a tattletale in the house. It's like support in our house. Dad, you know. I don't know if Chloe really was like that. But it, but it sounds like that to me. As I can encounter it. And so, you know, there's a problem. And Paul's moved to write this letter. But then, as I mentioned, you know, Paul's very careful with the way he uses words. He's nothing like me. Every word has a purpose for him, okay? But he writes this, and did you catch it in the, in the way he was writing uh, about bapti baptisms? I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, there was guys. I baptized guys. But, uh, but nobody else. So that you can't go on and say, hey, well, I was baptized in the name of Paul, or I side with Paul. Oh, but then there was Stephanus, but in his whole family. But aside from that, nobody else. It's almost kind of clumsy here. It's as if he's like these afterthoughts, right? And you begin to think, wow, what a terrible writer Paul is. But the truth is, that's for a fact. It's almost as if he's reminding us that, you know, those things are not really important. 
There are things you might remember here and there, but they're not the most important things. There are those parenthetical things. Oh, and another thing, right? There are those add-on things. And he adds them on in this way so that you know that it doesn't matter who you were baptized by. Because the real work in baptism doesn't happen by the fellow or the gal who sprinkles the water, but it happens by God. It happens by God. And i got to admit, you know, sometimes I, I get caught up in thinking that I'm really important. And I, I get caught up in thinking that, you know, it's me that's bringing people to Christ here. It's, and I get caught up in thinking, you know, you, you love me and you're happy to be here. And it's because of my great sermons that you show up. And then we remember to pray for David. David, I, uh, David this, David that, David the other. What about Bill? <laughs> <laughs> but then Paul's words remind me, you know, it isn't about you, Bill. <laughs> I praise God I didn't baptize any of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that is God. Well, you, know, that, you get what I'm saying? It isn't about the one who sprinkles the water, but it's about the one who created the water in the first place. It's about... It's about God who loves us so much that he sent us Jesus as a final invitation, as the ultimate invitation to be a part of God's family. He invited Jesus to come and take on our sins so that we could fit through the eye of the needle. He invited Jesus to come and take on all those things that prevent us from fully loving God the way God loves us. Let's have that next fill in the blank. It says, it's not about saying, I side with Paul on this thing. It's not about saying, I side with, uh, I side with uh, Peter on this thing. It's not about saying, I like to listen to Joel Olstein on Sunday morning. It's not about saying, I like to watch Bill's videos on the internet. It's not about saying, I'm side with Spawn on this thing. It's about being united in Christ Jesus. And Paul reminds those folks in Corinth, no matter how, I mean, everybody has a different flavor about how you come to know Christ, but in Christ, you're all united. He asks the question, is Christ divided? <laughs> Has Christ been divided? And the answer is no. Yes, he was crucified, but he was made whole in the resurrection, lifted up, for all of us. And we are all united in Christ Jesus. And when we fail to be united in Christ Jesus, we fail to be the body of Christ in the world. Now, will somebody pop out their Bible for a second and look up Matthew 5, verse 21. And read it out for us. Matthew 5, verse 21. Matthew 5, verse 21. If you get it, first one there, just read it out. You got it? Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Is that right? Oh, keep going. We're in the right place. Verse 21, keep going. Um, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Then go take care of uh, the argument. 
But you cannot be united in Christ Jesus. You cannot be united at the table of the Lord, the Lord's table. You cannot be united at the table of the Lord unless you have been reconciled with sisters and brothers. This argument that I had with my family table, we, we're not going to be a family if I don't just let it go. I was thinking it was all about the furniture. Ha! But it's really all about the reconciliation that needs to happen. And so after Julie set me straight, I sat Ethan down at the table and I said, I'm really sorry. I know that you missed your chair. And you need to miss that chair. But I put this here so that we could be a family and we would sit together and we would have a meal together. I'm sorry about the way I did things. And he said, thanks, Dad. I, I accept your apology. And I'm sorry that I'm having such a hard time letting go of my chair. The family of the Lord. The Lord's table is no different. And here's another little vignette about Ethan. He's really great. He helps me learn a lot about God. But when he was just a little baby, and he still loves these matchbox cars. You, have, you know him? Yeah. Yeah. And we used to go to worship, and he'd take a couple of matchbox cars to keep them occupied during the worship time. And uh, he had these matchbox cars in his hand, and it was time to go out for communion. And as a baptized member in the family of God, even though he was a baby and I needed to carry him, I kind of figured that, uh, you know, he should go out for communion. And so he really wanted to take those matchbox cars with him, and so he had had both matchbox cars, one in each hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was holding him, and he's sort of actually he could walk, as I recall, in this story. And he was walking up uh, to receive communion. And he noticed that everybody else, is, when they went up for communion, they had to open their hands to receive the gift of God. And as he's watching this going on, he's thinking, "I've got these matchbox cars. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do?" Holding the possessions is of the rich man, but holding our arguments as us, each and every one of us, we can come to the table and we cannot receive God unless we let it go. And as he was walking up towards uh, the bread and cup, he turned around at the last moment and let him go. Hang on to these. <laughs> so I took his matchbox cars and then he turned around and took his hands and he was ready to receive. And received the bread and dipped it taught me a lot about how we come to the Lord. Taught me a lot about how we need to be reconciled with one another. We can't even come to the table of the Lord with the arguments that we hold against one another. We need to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters. If you'd like to turn to the red hymnal to page 8, I often make that instruction when we go into the Lord's Supper. Up in page 8, you begin to see what at the top of page 8? What's there? Confession. Confession. So that is part and parcel to our communion. And so here's the pattern of communion. The confession, the pattern of communion begins with confession and pardon. And that's why we got to let those things go before we come to be the body of Christ, before we come and join as a family of God around the table. We have to let those things go. Okay, your challenge this week, if you choose to accept it, be the bigger person. I'm 40, he's 80. <laughs> yeah. Offer a gesture of peace. Sometimes this gesture of peace it can be as little as a hug or a kiss. Sometimes this gesture of peace means to be a phone call. I'm sorry I said the things I said. Offer the gesture of peace. Memorize the words of the confession. No, they're on the communicator, so if you want to take, you don't have to take home. You don't have to steal a hymn on today. <laughs> May you be blessed. <coughs> now that the good news has been proclaimed, and the scripture shared, may we share the best of ourselves.